Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Hyperconscious Podcast. Alan, what is Hyperconscious? Once you understand why something is the way that it is, now you have the power to change it. Great conversations with great people and great questions are the keys to the kingdom of unlocking your consciousness. Every single action that you do starts as a thought. When you control the way you think, you will control the way you act, and you will control the way you live. That is hyper-conscious. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Today, Alan and I were lucky enough to sit down with Dr. Jen Esker at DocGenFit on Instagram. She's a doctor of physical therapy, the creator of the Mobility Method, and when we were in Arizona, we were lucky enough to see her speak at Brendan Burchard's event. Yeah, Dr. Jen, this was a dream come true. Beautiful, beautiful episode with someone who is extremely successful, but we were able to pull back the curtain on some of the things that she struggled with growing up, insecurities, being overly critical and things like that. And uh, we really appreciate her being so vulnerable and authentic. Yes, she was super vulnerable going into the fact that at one point, she wasn't even comfortable putting her face on her social media. So we dug deep into that. Like Alan said, she was super vulnerable and we're sure that you guys will take something from it. We hope you enjoy. Talk to you soon. Bye. No, no, no. Um... Geographically, 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 this is cool. So I would say make sure that pretty face is showing. Yes, true. They're gonna want to see that fucking thing. They're gonna want to see that fucking thing, Alan. It's that true. fucking face. You good? Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. We are lucky to have another guest that we were able to see on stage at HPA Live. Mm. She is the creator of the Mobility Method. She is a doctor of physical therapy. She is at DocGenFit on Instagram. We are sitting down with Dr. Jen Esker. How are you doing today? I'm amazing. How are you? We are living the dream over here, truly. Oh, yeah. I'm going to let Alan ask the first question because I love Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, so we saw Dr. Jen on stage at HPA Live, and um, we were very blown away, especially by her pyramid of mobility that I want to get into. So I, just for, for your reference, Jen, I have a Naturally Fit for Life program that's based on what I call the five fundamental pillars of natural fitness. So number one is sleep, number two is hydration, number two is uh, new, uh, number three, rather, is nutrition. Fourth is training. And then fifth is mobility. And mm-hmm. I've kind of noticed that Kevin and I, as you probably know, if you've, if you've seen our Instagrams, we're very, very much into weight training. And mm-hmm. what I noticed is I've also started doing yoga over the last year quite a bit. And a lot of yogis, people that do yoga frequently, are typically, and again, this is a generalization, it's not always true, but typically I notice they're not as into weight training. And then a lot of people that are super into bodybuilding tend not to be into yoga. So I think that's a huge mistake because yoga's really opened up more potential for me personally in my natural physique game. And my first question for you is why do you think that is? You know, I think because we like to hone in on one particular thing and become good at it. And it almost becomes ego driven, right? So if I'm going to start yoga, Well, I see all these other yogis and they can touch their toes to their head and they can do all these other things. So that means that I just get to focus on this and not do anything else. Same with weight training. Oh, well, I want to become super big. I want to look a certain way. So I just need to do this and hammer it in and only do this. And we don't realize how much the crossover actually helps. (laughs) Mm. I love that. I I couldn't agree more. And, And I think that at any given time, every athlete has sort of a bottleneck with their mobility. Like it, whenever you talk to, like if I were to ask Kevin right now, like what's your biggest injury? Every you're... shoulder that I have on my body is broken. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you come across that too. So one of the first things I wanted to say to you that I admire is that you train weights, 
but you're also super mobile and you're, you're focused on helping athletes like me and Kevin um, get more mobile, which I think is huge. And I think that we tend to want to do what we're already good at. But unfortunately, if we can link up for our listeners, like mobility is going to help you in your craft tremendously. Thank you for saying that. And I think Kevin has the next question. I do. So, Jen, I was um, on your About Me page and a quote popped up and it really blew me away. And I want to ask you a little bit about it. So it said that my mission is to heal the world. And the best way I can do that is through empowering you to learn how to heal yourself. When did this mission become clear to you? Oh, man, I would say it was probably when I was in grad school that this kind of began to open up more and more for me because all I knew about physical therapy prior to going into PT school was really that I was watching a physical therapist watch movement and feel movement and essentially what I thought heal and fix people. So all I knew going into this was like, I want to help people. I want to fix people. When realizing there is no helping and fixing unless someone does it themselves. I mean, everything we do in life in order to improve on anything, it's what we do and what we put in the work of ourselves. So, and also realizing too, that I was seeing people in in physical therapy school who had, were born with certain disorders or what we would call disorders or illnesses or disease and yet living life fully and functioning on their own where it would otherwise seem impossible. For example, cerebral palsy, living in a wheelchair and literally watching him get down on the ground, put on his shoes and shirt and then pull himself back up and knowing that when he got too big to pull himself back up into the wheelchair, he started swimming. So like literally using their full capability in whatever it is that their body is capable of doing and actually doing that and realizing as well as I'm learning, as I'm going through learning special tests, learning how to diagnose, learning all these little, these little things, you know, I mean, realizing and seeing these people who really use their full capability and what they're able to do and realizing that majority of people don't. I mean, it's not about the diagnosis. It's not about the assessment. It's not about what we find really as a physical therapist, but it's what we empower other people to use these different tools that we learn for them to get into their own bodies. And as long as people have the tools, that's everything. Tools for meditation, tools for nutrition, tools for the body. I mean, as long as you start to learn the tools for yourself that your body needs, it's all up to you to actually create change and, and, you know, improve in your body. So for me, it's just learning that it's, it's not what I do for someone else, but it's what they do for themselves that really that was kind of born. Interesting. So um, there's a couple different questions that I really wanted to ask you. One of them in particular, I heard an interview where you were talking about um, being on an airplane and how you kind of just relax and you don't worry about it. But it's because of what you're doing when you're off the plane, because obviously when you're traveling for long periods of time, and I know you do a lot of traveling, you get kind of cramps and, and you're very immobile in those tiny little chairs. And I often say to people that a lot of the times when I'm out and about and I'm like doing a cheat meal or whatever, they see me eating like a, a cheeseburger and fries and they look at, you know, how I look and they're like, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. But what mm-hmm. I try to explain to them is it's what I'm doing every other day when you're not seeing me. So my question for you is, you've heard of obviously Pareto's principle, 80-20, 20% of our actions create 80% of our results. What is it? Mm-hmm. What is the thing that you do every single day that you never miss on for your mobility? For my mobility, I mean, it's really just getting into different mobility every single day and sitting on the floor. I do so much where I'm sitting on the floor, even if I'm sitting on a couch or my knees are up, my I'm sitting cross-legged. I'm making sure that I'm putting myself in sometimes uncomfortable positions and full range of motion through all my joints at some point throughout the day, whether that's reaching overhead, whether that's popping into a handstand and putting my wrists and my shoulders in full range of motion, sitting on the ground, putting my hips and knees in full range of motion, squatting all the way down to pull something and do something, getting my ankles in full range of motion. As long as I'm touching on that consistently every day, that is going to not only continue to maintain what I have, but improve what I have as well. I'm glad you went into that because when we, we were lucky enough to see you speak at HPA Live 
and you had us get out of our chairs and go <laughs> sit on the floor, and we had to get up off of the floor <laughs> from, from our butts without using our hands. Oh, yeah. Yep. And <laughs> I honestly think, Jen, that, that humbled a lot of people, I think, because... I know I can do that. I used to do jujitsu, so that's something I've been mm. doing for a long time. But mm -hmm. I was looking around the room, and not in a judgy way, just kind of like a, I was very interested to see how people were going to try to do it. And I think a lot of people were humbled because, like you said, I, I saw another interview where you said, as a baby, before you can walk, before you can crawl, you can put your foot in your mouth. Yeah. And we tend to like, how many people really get down on the floor? Like, especially now, you don't have a reason to. Like, we have comfortable couches. You know, yep. it, it, it's very interesting to me that when people tried to do that, they were humbled significantly. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. have you ever, when, when you said the breathing thing, when we were at HPA Live and you were talking <laughs> about breathing, like, you blew me away with all that stuff because I was going through a, um, I was sick. I don't know what it was. I still don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. But you were saying that the way you breathe controls the way that you think. So if you have like shallow chest breathing as opposed to belly breathing, your brain mm -hmm. is going to react differently. Can you go into that a little bit? Like the science behind that? Totally. And I like to like simplify the heck out of it because it really doesn't have to be as complicated as a lot of people make it. The reality is when most people want to get into a relaxed state we take a deep breath and we rise up into our chest shoulders lift and we blow it all out through our mouth <laughs> really that does nothing functionally for you to actually get you into a relaxed state um, it's more psychological at that point because you think that that is actually helping me get into a relaxed state but it's really not the reality is um, pretend someone scares you and Think about the reaction that you use on your body when that happens. You usually gasp, you take a deep breath, you clench everything super tight, and you breathe into your chest. Mm. So what I relate that to is your body goes on guard and it goes into protective mode when something is suddenly happening or it feels like it needs to protect itself. Well, the same thing happens if we're breathing all day long through our chest. So if we're taking these, these deep breaths, we're rising our shoulders, we're breathing in through our chest on a daily basis, your body is going to say, okay, I need to be on guard. I need to be protective because something stressful is happening or going to come at us. Your body doesn't know the difference between what you're telling it, how you're reacting to it, unless you actually start to change it. So, so if you want to actually start to get into a more passive, relaxed state of being, it really just takes first starting to breathe in and out through your nose, starting to relax the shoulders and the upper chest. I like to place my hands on my rib cage and uh, like my lower rib cage and more toward my belly area and allow my hands to kind of be the guide. So I might even tighten my hands around my rib cage and belly and then breathe into it. As I breathe in through my nose, I breathe into that space and that area in my hand so that I actually feel where the breath is supposed to be going. And then as you relax, you allow those hands to come down back together. So breathing in actually expands the belly and the, and the rib cage area. And the reason why that happens is because you have your diaphragm, which rests underneath your rib cage. And that actually drops when you breathe in. So in order to get that full diaphragm dropping when you're breathing in, that rib cage and that area has to expand. And then as you breathe out, the diaphragm lifts because it's pushing up into the, the, the lungs to actually press out air. So if we, we think about what's happening with the diaphragm, you actually have to expand from the rib cage to the belly area, not in a forceful way, but in a relaxed way. And breathing in and out through your nose actually helps to contain some of the carbon dioxide that we have. And the reason we should be kind of holding in that carbon dioxide, not expelling everything out through the mouth so often is because that carbon dioxide will latch onto what's called hemoglobin within the blood and release oxygen so that we get oxygen more into the body, more into the brain. Um, this is the same reason, I don't know if you guys have seen, but there's actually products out on the market now where it's like a tape across your mouth <laughs> when oh, you're yeah. sleeping. Yeah, when you're sleeping, when you're working out, anything like that, so that you're breathing through your nose all throughout the night and while you're working out. So you're actually getting more oxygen to disperse into your muscles, into your bloodstream, into your brain. Um, 
So we actually expel way more carbon dioxide typically than we need to. And when we take these huge, big breaths and we breathe everything out through your mouth, you're not actually helping to contain the, the oxygen within your body. Interesting. So um, I have another question to follow up to that. When you're weight training, I know you do a lot of strength training. Do you breathe through your nose the entire time? So for me, I really have been working on this like a ton because I'm definitely not perfect on it. And it's still, it's a transition for me because I've gone from always like learning how to do deep breath out through my mouth and, you know, breathe in and breathe out and, um, and expel a lot of carbon dioxide throughout your mouth. And it kind of becomes a habit. So it, for me, even it's like continuously remembering as I'm working out what I'm really focusing on and continuing to just make it a mindful practice. It literally is a mindful practice when I'm working out to, to consciously be aware of how I'm breathing. And if I can take more time to breathe in and out through my nose rather than using my mouth so much. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a, a continual work in process, I, a progress, I would say. And also it's interesting. It's like the same reason of like someone goes and they do a whole speech for an hour or they are doing a talk and answering a lot of questions and they're expelling a lot of carbon dioxide just by talking. So me doing a podcast, I might feel exhausted after. It's not necessarily that my energy was drained from you guys, but it was that I wasn't keeping a lot of oxygen within my body. Interesting. I never would have thought that ever. Yeah. Yeah. These are the things people need to know, Jen. Um, I, I really appreciate that. So I always am trying to get to a certain mental state prior to whatever, you know, is going to help me serve at my highest potential. So before a speech, I want to be in a different state than mm -hmm. before reading a book by myself, right? So so you breathing is one of the ways when things are kind of crashing down around us to, to get from a stressful state to a relaxed state. Do you ever do the opposite on purpose, like consciously? Um... There's definitely times to get into that more sympathetic state of being and teach your body actually how to relax in that. Um, that's a lot of like what Wim Hof does. Uh, a lot of those breathing techniques actually put you into the sympathetic state. Um, and, and it's very aggressive type of breathing, but it actually is a way to use the breath and expel a lot of carbon dioxide and actually get oxygen maintaining within the body. So I don't teach Wim Hof. I think it's a great method and something that I played with and practiced with. Um, so if anyone was more interested in, in diving into that, it's also, it's so, it's so great because there are going to be times in our life when stress is going to happen. And one of the ways they teach it through is by doing like cold water immersion. So if, when you go into cold water, your body automatically, adrenaline gets released, you go into that sympathetic state, but how can I now sit in that water comfortably in a parasympathetic state of rest and relaxation without being super stressed out? And with maintaining my oxygen, not losing all my oxygen with my body and like hyperventilating. So they really use breathing techniques to, to teach how to go from that sympathetic state of that high stress and take your body into a parasympathetic state so that it can actually relax, which is so important in life in general, people who have anxiety, people who have disease and stress. So a lot of those, those different types of breathing techniques, I think learning them across the board is super helpful. I'm glad we're talking about breathing techniques because I have been practicing like the belly breathing and, and focusing on deep breath since you taught us uh, in Arizona. So I'm very grateful mm -hmm. for that. I want you to know mm -hmm. that. Um, Thank you. Of course. I'm very curious to get your take on this. So mobility, fitness, all of that is a lifestyle for you. And a lot of people want quick, res quick results, mm -hmm. whether it's quick money, quick fitness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever it is. So when somebody comes to you and says like, you know, I, my new year's resolution is to do yoga once a week, or I'm going to do this 21 day fix, or I'm going to do this juice fast or whatever it is. When somebody says that to you and you have made a lifestyle of being healthy, of working on your mobility, like what advice would you give them to start a sustainable course of action to become more mobile, to become more into fitness, to become more into wellness? Well, I think the first question when when anyone says that they're going to do something or it is like a juice cleanse or whatever it may be, I, the first thing I ask is why? Mm, love that. So, and I think it's important for you, like listening at home, ask yourself why. 
why am I really doing this? What is it that I, that I feel like I'm going to get out of it? What is it that I've learned from it? What is it that I'm trying to, at the end of the day, achieve? Because if it is just a juice cleanse, believe me, I did it. It was awful. (laughs) Um, And I ended up eating way more on the last day. (laughs) Was I going to do it? Um, So I would say, you know, if it is something where you're like, well, I want to do this because mentally I'm trying to teach myself how I can overcome stressors within my life, stressors in my body and commit to something. Cool. Cool. That's a good lesson. Mm. But if it's like I'm trying to lose weight and I need the quickest and most and most effective way to do that, it really is going to backfire on you because that isn't teaching you how to sustain something long term. Everything we do in life is a lesson to teach us something. So just teaching our body how to starve itself and then go right back into divulging and food because you've missed it for so long is not a practice and actually sustaining lifelong results. This is, again, I have so many, so many different questions that are kind of popping into my head as you're talking. One of the ones that I really want to ask you, to, to be completely frank, Jen, there's people out there that consider you their dream physique. And I love that you asked the question why first, because if someone saw you, your physique, we saw you on stage, very impressive. It's a lot of times what I realize is that people may want to look that way, but if they really knew what it actually took on a daily basis for a decade or however long to, to attain it, they, they might think twice. So my question for you is when you were younger, when you were, let's dive into your childhood a little bit, did you ever think that you'd look the way you do now? Oh my God. I had no idea what I would look like when I was young. I Movement was just always a part of my life. So I feel definitely like spoiled in that, that I haven't had to work as hard as other people because there, I, for my entire life, I've been maintaining movement was a part of our life since elementary school. My parents required that we be in a sport. So I have just always been a mover. And on top of that, we went on family walks. We went on two family vacations a year, one that included wakeboarding or skiing and another that included skiing or snowboarding. So as a family, it was by nature, we were active. I saw my mom running every day. My dad went to the gym every day and it wasn't ever a question of how, why, or if you were going to, it was just a lifestyle. So I do feel incredibly blessed and spoiled Mm -hmm. in the fact that this has always just been my life. This has been led by example. This has been what has been shown to me, taught to me, led to me, and what I've always embodied. So also, I was this body that I have is genetically blessed as well. My parents also, if you believe in epigenetics, which is a biological thing that is happening, Mm -hmm. what your parents do for themselves will be passed on to you. My mom also has a great physique in terms of just naturally having more muscle mass. And I definitely got her body. I mean, I remember looking at pictures when I'm like five, six years old and I have a six pack. Like what? <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was just my body. And, and I even tell people like when I start to work out really, really well and, and it doesn't even always as matter what I'm eating. I mean, it does, especially now that I'm in my thirties, but my six pack is the first thing to, that comes and the things that stays like it just, I'm naturally, that is my body type. I don't lift really heavy weights for my upper body. And I always look like I'm super buff on my arms. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest to that on stage. I was like, wow, I think she's got bigger arms than I do. <laughs> <laughs> which, which you do for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, in like, in all fairness, I do do pull-ups, I do push-ups, I do handstands. So I do work out my upper body, not to say that I don't, but at the same time, I'm not in the gym trying to get a bigger upper body. I'm not trying to lift really heavy weights more than my own body weight. Um, so, so again, it's like, why, why go after someone else's physique rather than just seeing what's possible in your own body? Mm -hmm. Because there is zero comparison. This is muscle. Isn't always cool. It's now cool, but it wasn't cool. I was called the Hulk growing up. 
amongst my school friends because that's how much I look different from everyone else. Interesting. Wow. I'm glad you went into genetics and how you've kind of always been, at least from the sounds of it, confident with your body. I read one of your posts and you said that you had no issues doing handstands or, you know, the splits or any of that on your posts, but a lot of the times you wouldn't show your face. Oh, can, yeah. Can you go into how you became more confident in yourself and how you practiced that? Oh, yeah. I mean, that. And I actually, I think I talked about that on stage too at uh, Brendan's event, you know, and it was, it was this internal conversation and yes, I knew movement my entire life. Yes, I knew that this is what I liked. It literally made me feel good mentally as well. But at a certain point, especially getting into my twenties, I was working out because I was like, oh, I can't get fat. I can't get this. I can't get that. And it was, it was a very negative way of treating my body rather than appreciating my body for what I had. And, and also getting ready in the mornings, it was very, very natural for me to just tear every little thing down about myself rather than looking in the mirror, actually appreciating who I saw. And as soon as my social media started to grow, that only heightened. So I was like, oh my God, I can't show my face. Like, I don't want to be judged. Mm. And I remember, um, when Lewis and I started dating, both our Instagrams were growing. By the way, when we first started dating, I had more followers. Let's just oh, put that out there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Sassed him. Sassed him on air. We'll have to send this to him. <laughs> just this clip. Don't worry. We're going we're gonna to take just that part out. No context. This is what she's saying behind your back. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, I, I remember there was a comment that was left on his page and it said, you know, I get that she has a good body, but you could do so much better. Mm -hmm. And it was like, see, it was all the confirmation I needed. I mean, screw all the millions of other comments that were positive. It was this one comment that confirmed every little thing that I believed in myself, which was that I wasn't pretty. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't worthy. I, I shouldn't show my face, you know, all these things. And because in the beginning, my Instagram was very much just about look at what my body can do. Mm-hmm. I was in grad school. I was, it was more fitness based than anything. And it was very much so related to what cool things I can put through my body, especially through calisthenics, through learning after yoga, through what was more impressive rather than looking at who I was as a person. Mm. And, and it took some, it took really Lewis pointing it out and saying, you know, you're creating a really negative environment around you while I was getting ready in the morning. Cause it would, I would literally say out loud, oh, this looks bad. Oh, this is ugly. Oh, I'm fat. Oh, I'm this. Like it would, it would just be how I talk to myself, not needing to hear something from someone else. Cause it didn't matter what anyone else would say. It didn't matter if I was getting compliments. This is literally what I believed in myself. So looking at myself, whether someone was there or not, this is how I treated myself. And he, when he said I was creating a negative environment around me, that really hit me because I in no way want to create a negative space for anyone else to be around. Yeah. <laughs> it could be as negative as, as I want it to be for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. But I didn't want it to be pushed off into anyone else. So the fact that it was, and then I started seeing it in friends. I started seeing how they were tearing themselves down. I started Mm -hmm. seeing it from my my mom. And I was like, whoa, this is like, this is a thing. (laughs) This is a normal practice that we think we're being humble. We're not being braggy. We're like, whatever it may be. This was my definition of being humble, was tearing myself down. Interesting. I appreciate you going there. This is an intention I set. This is a year ago. I told Alan I wanted to have a beautiful woman on. And you're obviously, you're incredibly beautiful. You're incredibly talented. And you have a super big heart. So I want you to know that. And obviously you do. But Thank you. I, like you said, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It matters nope. what you think. That's the only thing yep. that matters. And mm-hmm. I always wanted to get the perspective of somebody who by all standards, is gorgeous, by all standards, has a ridiculous body and is super successful and figure out how they could start to think the way that everybody else did. So Mm -hmm. thank you so very much for going down that road. 
Yeah, of course. I mean, I think it's, it's important for people to hear so that people don't feel alone. Like a lot of the inner thoughts that, that we feel, we think we're the only ones who feel these things Mm. when it's not true. And so many other people go through stress, go through worry, go through comparison, go through all these things. So it's learning that you're not alone. Don't beat yourself up for feeling whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever it is that came up for you. Like, don't beat yourself up for, for thinking these things. Just learn from it. Okay. How can I take this in and accept that this is where I'm at right now? And how can I grow to be even better? I love that. This is, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you going there. There's one story in particular, and a a lot of things jump off the page for me, and I want to bring them to the listeners. Number one is that for all intents and purposes, you're a lot of people's dream body, uh, you know, absolutely beautiful, as Kevin mentioned. But again, like these negative thoughts you still have occasionally, and you have to kind of catch yourself and say, whoa, 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 what was that? What was that about? Why are you, you know, talking so poorly to yourself? And I, I, you know, I do that as well. Kevin does. We all have that. And so one of the things that I wanted to mention was I remember I was outside the gym one time with this uh, woman who is just, I won't name any names, but she's just basically what every, you know, bikini model would ever aspire to look like. And, you know, super, super successful in the fitness industry, absolutely killing it. And I'll never forget when it was, it was near summer and she's like, oh, I just don't really feel comfortable in a bikini. I remember thinking to myself, like, if you don't feel comfortable in a bikini, who does? You know, and so for someone out there right now who is trying to play this game of striving for a better and better body, like <clears throat> me, um, <laughs> what would you say to someone who, I like the striving part because it makes us better. I want to be stronger, yeah. better, smarter, of course. Yeah. But but how do you be also be happy along the way with the physique you currently have, in your opinion? Because how will it ever how will you ever be satisfied? How will you ever, what is better unless you appreciate what you have right now? Mm. I mean, and that's across the board for, for whether, wherever you want to go, whether that's business relationship, like nothing is going to move forward or you're never going to reach anything unless, unless you appreciate where you're at right now. And that's what it is. I mean, accepting and appreciating and being fully comfortable and loving and compassionate in where you are right now for what you're thinking, for what your, where your body is, no matter where your business is, where your relationship is, no matter what it is, instead of only focusing on what you don't have, what is not working, what is, you know, what expectations they have to get to and Mm. not appreciating where you are right now, you're never going to get there. It's always going to be this I don't feel good enough. I um, shouldn't be in this bathing suit, whatever it is. And the interesting thing for me too, I didn't like the, the people that really stood out for me were not the people that were the skinniest or the prettiest. The people that stood out for me that I truly admire today still are the people who are not by society standards, the fittest, the prettiest, the whatever, but they 100% own where they're at and it looks freaking gorgeous. Mm. And I think other people can relate to this. Like it's not the person who's super poised that you look up to. It's the person who's like, doesn't care what they look like in a photo or a video or whatever. And they're just owning it. And truly you can feel the authenticity and the realness in, in how they're, they're being. And that person is like magnifying and they're, they, they, you know, magnetize you into them because of how they're showing up. I'm glad you touched on gratitude. Alan and I literally recorded an episode on gratitude last night, not even uh, (laughs) 12 hours ago. So (laughs) it's a little cooked. Yeah, Yeah, we're we're a little cooked. But I'm super glad you touched on that because I think that the practice of gratitude is something, it's like mobility. Like people do it on Thanksgiving. It's cool, like to talk about what you're grateful for. But the rest of the year, it kind of goes forgotten about. So I'm glad you touched on that. Um, I have a very unique question, I think. You are almost at 600,000 followers. You just said that you're dating Lewis Howes. Like, you have a very interesting life, right? Is the life that you're living now what you expected? Like, when you got to this stage, did you expect it to be the way it is now? Uh, I think I had zero idea. When I was going into, initially into physical therapy school, I was teaching Pilates at the time. So I was like, oh, I'll be a Pilates rehab specialist and I'll work for someone else. I 
had zero intention of owning my own business, doing my own thing, anything like that. Like I, I heard the word business and I was like, that's over my head. I don't know that. So (laughs) I had zero intention of ever creating something for myself. I had zero intention of creating a social media that was going to grow a following in general. I had no idea that was going to happen. Um, when I started dating Lewis, I was like, okay, he'll be for fun right now. But I had zero intention of that (laughs) even going anywhere. Um, it was just, I mean, life is, is crazy. And when you open yourself up to the possibility of what could be, and you just continue to follow what makes you happy and what you're passionate about, so many things can open up. And that's truly what's happened for me. Yeah. That, uh, this is, this is already one of my favorite interviews. So you, I, I want to ask you several things, but first of all, like mentors and heroes. So growing up as a child versus now, do you have, I always say what we admire is what we will subconsciously be drawn towards and, and kind of become. So you got to be really careful of who your influences are. It's very clear in this interview that you have several really good influences. One in particular you mentioned like is sort of like the spiritual master who fully owns where they are currently at, being fully in the moment, regardless of whether or not they like look good on the camera angle or yeah. whether they're dressed to the nines or have makeup or whatever, right? So do you have anyone in particular that you look up to and admire and continuously learn from like on a weekly, bi-weekly basis in terms of like mentors and heroes? I mean, so many. <laughs> um, I would say initially, you know, growing up, my my mom is obviously a very huge influence because this lifestyle of taking care of yourself and always putting movement and self-care first, like she really did that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't... Uh, it was, it was part of it have to, she would go get a run or go like we, I remember riding my bike next to her as she's running. I remember she would even tell us she used to drop us in the sandbox so she can go run around the track. I mean, (laughs) she figured out a way of whatever it needed to happen so that she could have that self care of taking care of herself first so that she can take care of the family. And just having that modeled is everything. And the way that she takes care of herself and the family again, without hesitation, without question, without, with just getting things done is so admirable and something I continue to admire to this day. And then I would say my grandma is a huge influence in a different way where she was always the freaking powerhouse. Like talk about a woman who spoke her truth, owned her voice, was the fucking like boss of everything (laughs) and you didn't ever want to piss off, but like she was, she owned her, her like presence and you could really feel that every single time. And she owned her voice and she wasn't afraid to use it. She wasn't afraid to like take charge in any moment. And that too is a huge, just in a different way, a huge influence in, in teaching me how to be this empowered leader, loving, you know, open and powerful. I really got that example from her. To use Alan's quote, I have a million questions I want to ask you, but um, (laughs) I want to know, so in a lot of your posts, you have like a lot of positive affirmations. Is that something that you practice daily? Do you have like a gratitude and affirmation practice? I do. I do. So, I mean, going back to when I realized that I was talking really negative to myself and I was creating a negative environment, I vowed to myself that for 30 days, I would write three things I loved about myself Mm. every day. And I was grateful for about myself every day. And it had to be about me, which was hard because I could say millions of things of what I was grateful for and loved about other people (laughs) or other things around me, other circumstances. But it was hard for me to actually come up with three things a day to say about myself. But that really helped to shift. And on top of that, I asked for support. I asked for support from my mom. I asked for support from my friends who I knew were in this negative language with me and said, Hey, listen, I'm not going to allow you to talk negative about yourself around me. You're going to have to switch anything you say that is negative. And I'm requesting that if you hear me say anything negative about myself, you, you ask me to switch that as well. I love it. I haven't heard you say anything negative yet, but I'm I'm on you. I'm on you. (laughs) If you could hear the thoughts of my Um, own head, you'd say, Alan, stop saying that about yourself. You're doing fine. (laughs) And it really, it's, 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 
it's transformed everything. It's transformed the way I talk to my clients, my, my patients, like everything. I mean, they will tell you themselves. I catch every little thing that they say, whether their pain is bad, their injury is bad, no matter what, we're shifting that conversation. Like it's not bad. It's something we're learning from. It's not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. Like I'm constantly reframing language for other people because it's a reminder for myself to reframe language for myself. Um, so that is, that is a huge thing and a constant thing that I'm doing with friends, with myself on a daily basis, just reframing language and, and how things are coming up. And then on top of that, um, Lewis and I say three things we're grateful for every night before we go to bed. Interesting. Uh, the, the girl I'm currently uh, dating, going on dates with, um, she's actually my ex, but we restarted, we started talking. It's a whole thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's all good. We have the gratitude game and we do three things before bed. We take turns. Ladies first. And um, that's the first time I've ever heard someone else do that. And it's funny because the reason we're talking, thoughts become things, she was a big fan of you. And she said, Alan, there's someone um, that I know of that this is like a year ago that you'd really, really like. And she's wow. like, do you know who Lewis Howes is? And I'm like, interesting. And so I, I, she's like, she literally said that one of my you know, heroes is, is dating him. And I'm like, oh, I know Lewis Howes. And then we saw you at HPA Live with Lewis. And that's kind of... The first time I was ever exposed to you and Lewis was kind of through her. Um, mm. And it's funny that you just said that because we do the gratitude game. Plus, we did the gratitude episode yesterday. Thoughts. It's all happening. It's all happening. <laughs> it's all happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's cool that you're willing to be vulnerable because people like Jenny are looking up to you. And to realize that you're at this point in your life where, you know, you've got the followers, you've got the business. At one point, you didn't even know what business was, right? It's super <laughs> intimidating. And now you realize, oh, it's actually, you know, pretty pretty simple once you, you know, lower the intimidation factor. And I want to say that business is simple, but it's, it's we make it this whole impossible thing in our heads. And then you realize like, oh, okay, it's, you know, marketing plus innovation plus selling something of service. And then that rinses and repeats, right? So, um, so what do we say to someone who is like where you were maybe 10 years ago when you didn't have a business and you didn't have a following and you were in the mirror and you were, you know, picking yourself apart a bit and you, you didn't feel good enough. Like, how do we get them to realize that, that over time, really big things can happen for you if you start down this, I want to give people extra why power to start talking mm -hmm. positive about themselves like you. Cause it sounds mm -hmm. like your whole life turned around once you started thinking positive. Right. Oh my God. Everything, everything turned around. Um, I mean, really it just starts with listening in. What are your internal conversations that you're, that you're having? Because you don't know anything to change unless you start increasing the awareness of it. Mm. You don't know that you're talking bad about yourself unless you ask people to point it out for you. Interesting. And, and having that support system around you with people who are authentically going to tell you when you're being shitty to yourself <laughs> is, is a huge, is a huge win and not, and not something to take lightly, you know, and realizing that you're not alone. You're not alone in how you feel. You're not alone with the scars that you've been, that you, that have been put on you for whatever reason. We've all been through different life experiences and it's not, there's no bad and worse. There's no comparison. Um, and I was in this huge comparison mode when I first got into personal development work, it was like, well, I have amazing parents. My parents are still together. I didn't get raped. I didn't like, I was in full comparison mode of, mm -hmm. I don't need this because I'm great. Like I, I did grow up super blessed and I'm extremely grateful for the childhood I have. But there were still things that happened to me that made me obviously think negative about myself and feel negative about myself and say that my voice wasn't worthy to be heard and I'm not enough and, and all these other th experiences that I placed upon myself. So also just being able to say, okay, this isn't a place to compare. Just like Instagram, it's not a place to compare. Yeah. It's not a place to judge yourself or others. Like there's zero judgment in the in a space of just trying to get back to love, love within yourself, love within others, and and really pushing that out to the world around you. So there's no room for comparison. There's no room for judgment. So first of all, allowing yourself to truly listen to yourself, allowing yourself to ask for support to increase the listening and increase the awareness, and and knowing that it's okay. Wherever you're at, 
whatever you're feeling, whatever you're experiencing, it's okay. You, we get to accept it and become aware of it because it's the only way that we learn to grow from it. Two, do you want to ask a question, Kevin? Well, uh, we're, uh, we're going to come up on the clock here, so I think we should ask our final two questions. Okay. Um, Dr. Jen, I really appreciate you going there. That was... I got all the feels, all the feels right now. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. I'm really enjoying learning from you, and I really appreciate your perspective and how deep you're willing to dig with us, and it really means the world to us. So we both have questions that we like to ask every guest, and we've gotten some very unique, very different answers. I'm very curious to see where you go with it. So my question to every guest thus far has been, what do you hope to accomplish before you die? Oh. It's morbid here at the end. Be done. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Impacting people to just start to listen in, tune in, and take care of this one body that we have to live in right now because this is the only thing that's going to drive us forward to accomplish anything in life. So unless we start taking care and paying attention to what we have within our body, this is there's nothing else that can come from us. So really just... I want to impact as many people as I can and getting that message across. I love it. Yeah, the whole world around you can be great. Your circumstances can be great. But this one vessel you're in um, is just everything. Because if you don't feel good internally, I always say this to my clients and stuff. I say, if you don't feel well, what are the chances you're going to go out and do well? And one of the things that jumped off the page while you were talking earlier was... Once you connected that you don't want other people to come into your negative space, that was when you decided, okay, I owe it to other people to be positive. And for you, it seems like that was your why that really tipped the scale. And I want to bring that to the listeners because I feel like we have a lot of really incredible, altruistic, compassionate people out there that are willing to do more for others than they are for themselves. But what they need to realize and what I've needed to realize is that we owe it to other people to be in a good, positive place and to not shit on ourselves right? Totally. Um, totally. So thank you for that. The The question that I always ask, and Kevin's kind of like, all right, I don't No, we, no, <laughs> I was I was very intrigued with where you were going. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whenever he looks at me, I'm always like, okay, I get it. We no, gotta no. go. We gotta go. <laughs> Anytime I hear somebody say shit on themselves, I, I perk right up. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Um, so the question that I want to ask you and that I ask uh, most of the guests, um, I have a chain around my neck. It's uh, the North Star. And it's unwavering, it's constant, it's a guide for people. And so for me, it personally, it represents um, my purpose. And I think we grow, we evolve, we change, we learn. We constantly talk about this, that on the podcast. That's why we have the podcast, to help people get into personal development, pull back the curtain on how to learn, grow, and evolve, and change. But I do believe the deepest part of us never changes. So what about you never changed? My love, compassion, and and really my focus for wanting to just help and serve other people. You hammered it. I love how clear her answer was. Right? That you was, hammered it. A lot of people thing. have to like think for 15, <laughs> 20 seconds. The way you hammer that, I think you're in d- direct alignment with your purpose. Like You are hammering out content. I'm sure it gets overwhelming, but like you're teaching so many people. People are making positive, concrete changes because of you, so... Um, I think you're doing your thing. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, I mean, to be, I don't think it would have grown at all or become a business and whatever it is if I wasn't truly aligned with what I'm promoting and what I'm talking about. So speaking of business and promoting, what do you have for the listeners? What do you have for programs, websites, books, songs, anything? <laughs> Promote away. <laughs> so I do have what I feel is is the key to kind of learning and starting to listen to your body, which is called the mobility method. And it's my way of being able to provide in-home therapy for you without needing me. So it has a full body assessment to see where your joints are, where your range of motion is, and then teach you all of the tools to be able to get you back into your body. And it really is, it's a one-time fee for you to be able to use at your expense at any time. So I always say there's no one perfect plan. There's no one perfect program. You get to design your own program based on what you need for your own unique, beautiful body. So really finding the exercises that are needed for you based on your restrictions is key. And 
don't get sucked into the one, you know, the one 12 week program for mobility or the one, whatever it may be. Like there's not just one of anything, there's tools and all those tools help us to find what we need within our own body. So that's what I provide with the mobility method. Um, and then beyond that, I also have a membership called the optimal body where you don't have to think. <laughs> you, you don't have to self-assess. Um, so it's for, you know, people just on the go wanting to just use things like mobility, understanding what the core really is and how to utilize the core effectively. And then easy at-home HIIT workouts maybe not easy, hard yeah. <laughs> at home hit workouts that you can get a good sweat on, get your cardio and your strength involved all in one and not even have to use any equipment at all, really. Um, so that is a month to month subscription for 20 bucks a month to get all of that and more. Um, and then I do want to provide for your listeners just a free, um, free challenge. It's called docgenfit.com slash challenge. And it's, it's, it's a way to start to learn what mobility is, why you need it in your body. And you actually do two assessments on your body every day and two mobility exercises for those assessments every day. And it takes no longer than 10 minutes and you get to create your own mobility flow to see what your body needs. I'm going to set an intention right now. Kevin and I are going to be in Jacksonville. I was just going to say the same thing. Well, I beat you to it, brother. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Kevin and I are going to be in Jacksonville, Florida with one of my mentors. Um, we're going to be recording training programs down there. One is going to be my Naturally Fit for Life online training program. One is going to be the hyperconscious training program that Kevin's doing. And he had said to me, Alan, why don't we wake up every morning and do yoga? And uh, mm. I think what we should do is do this. I agree. This, this free challenge. I here agree. This is a great sure. opportunity for us to build in these habits of mobility and making sure yes. we're, we're doing the right things. Is the breathing yeah. stuff in there, though? I have that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's more in my gratitude one. Um, I do go. I, I mean, I every mobility tool that I use, it has to have an element of breath work in it because the only way we start to improve mobility is actually releasing the stress and the tension that we have in our body. So I do breathing through every single mobility tool. Okay. I've been, uh, you know, Kevin and I have been chasing dreams. We, we filled our plate oh, way yeah. more than oh, we yeah. ever have before. I think uh, stress management is going to be key. Um, Jen, thank you so much for coming on the show. All the listeners out there, it's at Doc Jen Fit, D O C J E N F I T on Instagram. Um, please, please, please follow her. She does a lot of really cool acrobatic stuff with Lewis that now Jenny and I are going to try. By the way, if I get hurt, it's, it's definitely on me. I, I take full liability. Um, but I love that you post so much value and so much educated science. Um, and so thank you so much for coming on the show. This is a real dream come true. Yes, we appreciate you coming on. I can literally feel your positive energy. I'm huge on energy. And since we started <laughs> this call, I have been able to feel it the whole time. Is there anything you would like to leave the listeners with before we let you go? I would like to just say, you know, have you listened to your body today? I love it. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jen Esker, great episode. We appreciate you and we will chat with you later. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for listening to another episode of the Hyperconscious Podcast. Going hyperconscious will absolutely change your life because if you understand why something is the way it is, now you have the power to change it. If you going hyperconscious with us has changed your life in any way, please share this episode with one of your friends because the more people that go hyperconscious, the better this world is going to be for everybody. And if you would kindly leave us a five star review on iTunes, that would help us make more people hyperconscious and we would be greatly appreciative. Thank you. Bye.